I'm just going to, I'm just going to hand over to Tressa now, who will take us through the session uh, and um, yeah, over to you. Thanks so much, Dave. And can everybody hear okay? Yeah. Yep. So I've not got a presentation. I do have a wee film to show you. Um, and I'm going to talk to my notes, which is always better because I'm more likely to stick to saying what I'm supposed to be saying than drifting off. But I'll probably do that as well. But anyway, um, good morning, friends and colleagues. I do hope you've enjoyed the conference so far. I know you've all been involved in a two day conference. It's really lovely to be here today. Unfortunately, I've been so flat out and we've got such a lot of work on. I've not been able to attend the rest of it, but really happy to be here and spend time telling you a bit about my favourite subject, Glasgow Disability Alliance, um, which I'll call GDA for short. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing from all of you too. And I know we're going to get a chance to do a wee bit about that later on. So I've been asked to talk, as um, Dave says, uh, about climate change and how people who face additional barriers, in our case, it's disabled people, um, are more likely to experience the worst impacts of climate change and yet are less likely to be involved in the planning of climate actions or the measures to help the situation. Uh, I think it's really interesting to be speaking to you at this time. It's one year on from COP26, which was a, a really exciting time in Glasgow, a time that we were invited to bring alive some of the issues about climate change and disabled people. And so we have been working on this um, since before then and during and since then, building on the work that we've done and facilitating a series of events and activities around what we're calling climate justice and preparing for green participatory budgeting. And it is worth saying that the opportunities for green PB in Glasgow at least have stalled. And this has been because of the pandemic, the huge amount of need that there is in Glasgow to be met, the cost of living crisis and the budgetary constraints. Those are the things that I know about. Those are my best guess um, as to why it's stalled. But we have continued our work and I'm going to say a wee bit about this much later on. So just uh, rewinding a wee bit for those who don't know Glasgow Disability Alliance, we're a disabled people-led organisation. We have five and a half thousand disabled members across Glasgow, um, and it's people with all different types of impairment and conditions. So pan impairment, mental health, learning difficulties, physical impairments, people who have hearing difficulties and are deaf, people with visual impairments who are blind, um, all sorts of conditions, people who have had brain injury or affected by stroke and the likes. Um, I'm a disabled person myself, I'm the, the chief exec. My deputy is also a disabled person. The board are disabled people, over 50% of the staff are disabled people. And we're a grassroots community of identity driving social change. And what I would say at this point is something I never actually wrote down, but it does occur to me to say it is, although our members are very empowered because of the support that they receive from GDA, take away that support and that access, and they are incredibly disempowered, disadvantaged people. They remain those things in their lives anyway, but through their involvement the GDA, with GDA, they have more empowerment and they have more of a platform. But it is important to say as soon as that's stripped away, it doesn't exist. So our mission is to promote equality, rights and social justice with and for disabled people. And our work builds on foundations of both individual and collective community empowerment. Peer support's a bedrock and we draw on disabled people's own strengths. And there's kind of three things that we do. So one is that we build individual people's capacity through a programme of holistic services and supports. So we have community learning and development uh, programmes, fun activities that we run, bringing people together. We've got welfare rights that we offer. We've got a wellbeing service. We've got a digital inclusion service. Those particular last two things were set up during the pandemic and we're struggling to keep them funded, but they're very much needed more now more than ever. Um, so we're doing that. And all of these things help people to kind of build their confidence, build their capacity, be connected. The second thing is that we amplify the voices of disabled people as a diverse community, contributing their lived experience and participating in dialogue and deliberation and collective advocacy. And the point of that is to bring people together to, to, to really think through the things that we want to say are the priorities for disabled people. Sometimes it's not one thing, it's not one position. So dialogue and deliberation is really important to decide on the priorities. And then the third thing that we do is to collaborate with people, um, usually local and national government, the NHS, other public sector partners towards change. Hopefully at times that's co-designed 
certain things have to be in place for it to be co-design. Obviously, there's got to be a shared of power for that to be meaningful. Um, so many times we're just feeding in disabled people's views and priorities. And on some occasions, it is co-design. And that's about contributing to solutions about poverty, inequality and exclusion. And I would say that our work to strengthen and deepen deliberative democracy really does support better decision making um, about public funds and contributing to a rebalancing of power in Glasgow and Scotland, or at least that's our intention um, as to whether that's happening is, a, is another thing. At this point, I'm going to pause and I'm going to bring in the actual voices of our members, um, if that's okay with you, and I'm going to show you a wee film it's our Purple Poncho players, which are a kind of um, theatrical wing of, of our um, more active members, our, our drivers for change. And they use poetry and song and sketches to bring alive some of the issues facing disabled people. So I hope you'll enjoy it. Um, I'm going to do that thing of sharing my screen now um, and hoping it works. So hopefully, hold on a second. Okay, give me two ticks. I think it's this one. And I have to share sound. Okay, so for the next 10 minutes or so, I'll give you the purple poncho players. Four hundred and twenty-seven days. Four hundred and twenty-seven bloody days. That's how long it's been since I've been out there. Out in the world. But tonight's the night. And the feeling's right. Those Tinder chats are finally going live. Mm -hmm. First date. In town. A few drinks. Bye to eat. Been, been saving up for this. To finally meet. See that smile for real? <laughs> I've got butterflies. <laughs> I've got butterflies. I bring up Google Maps to check the area, you know. Outdoor furniture, parking, accessibility, toilets. I, um, I'm saying, do you have wheelchair access? Wheelchair access in your pub? An accessible toilet? The accessible toilet? Is that even legal? I'll have to get the bus. I'm hoping I can park right outside. I'll need to leave two hours early. Or should I get a taxi? But that would mean dipping any moustache. How would we could forget the meal? Let's just have drinks. I put on some links. I put on some sparkle. And oh, so here we go. The bus doesn't come. The streets have all changed since lockdown. I walk towards town, but it's raining. There's no blue badge spaces. Where have they gone? My one and only good jacket soaked through. I abandoned the car in some side street. I'm, I'm miles, miles away. away. I flagged down a cab. I can't be late. I try hard to wheel myself through town, negotiating bumps and cycle lanes and... Ben, what the f... And I nearly get knocked down in the process. I count out my money in the back of the taxi and I'm watching that meter like a hawk. The merchant city is stowed. Every pavement's full of folk having a good time. They don't see me. I asked the driver to let me off at the bridge. It's all I can afford. If I run up or Gale Street, I might just make it. I know the pub agreed to buy Goma, but there's tables and benches and my chair can't get past. There's crowds of folk. They're drunk and they're shouting and I get a panic in my chest. The noise, jeez. I count to ten. I go up a side street, but there's outdoor heaters and tents, and my wheel gets caught between a bollard and a planter. I run past Goma and find a pub. I scan the crowd. I'm stuck on the street for 20 minutes before some waiter asks if I need help. Aye, I, I need, need help. help. <sighs> of course she would go. Why would she wait? I'm an hour late. I want to call her, but I've no minutes left. I want to call him, but I can't get through. I wander through the city, soaked through to the skin. It takes an hour and a half for me to get back to my car, negotiating drunk folk living their best life. I take the long walk home. Thinking about your smile. One, One day. day. Maybe.
Hello world now friends, I've come to join you once again, isolating for near two years, stuck indoors with those endless spears, without carers every day to keep me clean, times were lean. But now I've got the vaccine. In Covid dreams I'd go uptown, swan into bars, taking the sound of all the banter and the merry cheer. I'd nod to the barman. Ah, it's good to be here. I've missed the contact from human souls. It fills your cup way up to the top. But hey, I've got my vaccine. I'll take the bus to George's Square. Just hope they lower that we stare. Then make my way down to the city lights converse with strangers deep into the night. I'll try and dodge the outdoor chairs and heated lamps, the lack of ramps. Cause team, I've got the vaccine. But pals say, you'll end up home. Get an hour, you'll be on the phone. Russian roulette with on cycle lanes. Then no toilet access, a bouncer kindly explains. Parking cars in Blue Badge Bays are bygone days, Aye, so the council says. But mate, I've got my vaccine, so it's up the road I go. But the bus I need's a no-show. Dodging potholes to the taxi rank while watching others laugh, my heart it sank. It's taken months of building courage just to leave an emotional heave. Ah, it seems unfair. Now I've got the vaccine. Mr. World, Mr. World, Mr. World, you wanted to see me? Aye. This COP26. You think I'll do the trick, Rose? Do the trick? In saving me. I live in hope. Because I'm knackered, Rose. But you're... Spent. No wonder. I feel every part of my body's been wrung out and squeezed dry. You know, you way? I certainly do. I lie in bed at night watching Blue Planet, trying not to cry, thinking of humans take, take, taking for me and never replacing. That's awful. Folk like you. Me? The subs. The subs? The single-use plastic self-seeking shite bags. The chopped onion brigade. The plastic straw suckers. No. The ready meal rat bags. No. Don't try and deny it. I've raked through your bin bags. I can explain. Eh, have you seen my wee turtles? My fish? Yeah, but if you let me... The contaminated water. I know. Plastic uh. used in minutes here for centuries. Yes! I know, but because of my disability, I can't survive without using them. Because of my disability? There are alternatives. Ever heard of metal straws? Bamboo? An onion? That you chop? Yeah, but the, the, the metal straws, they heat up in my tea and then they scald my mouth. Bamboo? Yeah, but they're too rigid, just like the metal ones. And, and if I have a spasm, then they rip the inside of my mouth. So what's your excuse for buying chopped veg then? Uh, and ready meals? Well, social care cuts means that I've not got anybody to help me cook a meal from scratch. So it's either ready meals and free chopped veg, or I don't eat. What do you mean you don't eat? Well, I starve. You starve? I don't know any other way to say it. Look, Mr. World. I want to help you recover, Mr. World. I really do. I care about the wee turtles and all the wee fishes and the rivers running clear. But until the powers of you understand that social care and climate change are interlinked, then... Then... Then I can't help you out. I'm sorry. There has to be something you can do. I'm literally dying in my arse here. Well, there is something. You could ask the uh, policy makers to invite folk like me to the table and listen to our needs, and I mean really listen, and then ask us to help come up with a solution. 
That simple. That was that simple. Right. Get a wee Greta Thunberg in here. Oh, and Sturgeon and Biden. And that boy he'd Boris too. We've got some talking to do. People still here okay? Yep, brilliant. I really hope you enjoyed it. So I think, I mean, from from our point of view, it's it's entertaining, it's what the feedback we've had is, it's thought provoking, it shows some of the kind of interrelated barriers that disabled people face across the whole of their lives, including having no voices and decisions that affect them. And it does touch on how far removed they are from either taking actions or planning actions towards climate change and saving the planet because in some cases they maybe don't have the right social care or they can't afford it or whatever it might be. As some of you will know, disabled people aren't starting from the same playing field as non-disabled people and nothing demonstrated that better than the COVID pandemic. Um, I think the kind of phrase that people have used banded about for a long time is that we might well have all been in the same storm, but we were most definitely not all in the same boat. And disabled people had fewer lifelines, to continue the metaphor, uh, than many people, and they faced multiple and deep layered exclusion and consequences as a result of COVID and the supercharged inequalities that that brought about. We engaged with, we basically down-tooled and, and phoned um, our, our members and spoke with over 6,000 disabled people. We had 2,500 survey monkeys completed online and all sorts of barriers were evident so people couldn't get information. 80% of people weren't aware of local supports. 82% faced social isolation. People were digitally disconnected in very large numbers, over 60%. 83% faced barriers, 83 faced barriers to access 
access and the support they need because all the social care packages were cut. So nearly 2,000 packages in Glasgow were cut. 90% were concerned about physical and mental health. 62% particularly concerned about mental health and that has now risen to 80%. 57% were worried about poverty and money and hardship. All sorts of things. Over 90% of people we spoke to, I suppose it's no wonder, um, wanted disabled people's voices to be heard in policies and services and decisions that were being taken at that time. And it's the very absence of these voices that's apparent in planning for world events like a global pandemic or indeed COP26 um, or inclusive climate change and climate justice generally. So disabled people and others have reframed the discourse from talking about climate change to talking about climate justice to understand that it's much wider than just a bit about environmental and physical. In fact, it is much more accurately connected to equality or indeed inequality um, and the lack of human rights that people get because the impacts of climate change are not experienced equally. Pre-COVID, disabled people in Glasgow and in Scotland and around the world were already more likely to live in poverty, to face prejudice and discrimination and lack of opportunities across the whole range of life outcomes like education, employment, access to services, information, all those things that I touched on that we found during COVID, but those things existed before, social connections, the ability to participate and contribute. All of that has combined in health inequalities and poorer life outcomes. And we saw some of that reflected in the performance. And the reasons why impacts of climate change are not experienced equally are interrelated and they're connected to all of these barriers. Some examples of that impact includes the fact that during the pandemic, the people that experienced the emergency are, and most adversely were affected were disabled people and they do sustain disproportionately higher rates of morbidity and mortality during these types of things like a pandemic, like a crisis like um, Katrina or indeed the war in Ukraine. So, for example, during COVID, more than 60% of the people that died or about 60% of all the people that were died have died, have been disabled people. And even removing factors of impairment and condition, it cannot be accounted for as to why that is. So the analysts are inferring that it is connected with the discrimination and the barriers that people have faced throughout their lives and that this is actually the reason for it. Certainly during COVID, we ended up, as many organisations did, doing a whole range of things that we'd never done before, one of which was providing food to 2,800 plus disabled people who weren't able to access other supports. We know that Inclusion Scotland, our sister organisation, which is a national disabled people-led organisation, has written a report and has collated evidence about how people died in their own homes or nursing homes in the aftermath of Katrina. And that was because shelters and emergency transport weren't accessible. And again, there's, there's currently evidence in relation to the war in Ukraine of disabled people being very, very um, worse, worse impacted would be the best way to describe it. I know a special report from the UN committee went up in September um, and it said that it was gravely concerned over the treatment of disabled people and it refers to them as being kept in inhumane conditions and that's because their evacuation from residential institutions in conflict areas was not prioritised and is not being prioritised. Neither is the need for medicines um, or accessible transport or accessibility devices and other accommodations, things like continence pads. That's something I'd say. So during the pandemic, when we did the emergency food response, because people were slipping through the shielding net or not being met, their needs weren't being met, the kind of thing that shielding wasn't doing, was it wasn't providing continence pads, things like that that we thought of, chopped vegetables, things that require other other plastics, things that make it harder for disabled people to comply and cooperate with climate actions. So we were providing a lot of that and that's not routinely done. It is a sobering thought that some people's lives can be reduced to so little value in a fight for survival, which has felt like and become survival of the fittest. And despite the obligations in human rights law, disabled people have perhaps been the most overlooked group in climate change planning and policy making and negotiations. And that was shown by COP26 itself, not only through the exclusion um, of the Israeli minister who couldn't get in, I don't know if people remember that, it was breaking news at the time, um, but actually things as simple as our deputy CEO couldn't attend, we were supposed to be in the blue zone, but there was no provision or enablement for her to take her personal assistant, they just said no, even when we explained it was a disabled person, so she was prevented from going. 
The event itself also impacted on disabled people living in Glasgow. So GDA members living in the exclusion zone reported being imprisoned in their own homes. Streets were cut off. Social care workers couldn't get to them. They couldn't get out to see their GPs for essential appointments. Barriers to moving around the city due to road, road closures and protests. And very little information about how that was all going to work was given out in advance. So people were, were you know, stuck in many ways. So we really need to address the relationship between the rights of disabled people and the efforts that we're making to combat climate change. And there's lots of examples where involving us in plans and discussions might have avoided these unintended consequences. Because we're, we're quite clear, disabled people are clear, these things aren't intended. But by leaving us out, by leaving out the voices and the experiences and the priorities of disabled people, you also leave out our contributions towards the solutions. And examples include things like banning plastic straws without accepting that some disabled people need them to drink safely and conveniently, removing disabled parking bays to make way for cycle lanes, that's happened a lot in Glasgow in the city centre, promoting active travel without realising that some disabled people can't walk, um, they maybe can't wheel or cycle easily um, because they don't have the support to do that or they physically can't cycle, promoting recycling without providing support. So disabled people not having their social care needs met means that they may not be able to take out their stuff to recycle it in different bins. They might not have access to those bins. I live in a tenement. We don't have all the bins that you're supposed to have for these things in Glasgow. We've got some, but not all. So we've got, I think, cardboard and paper, but not glass, for example. Um, and then there's the hostility and aggression um, towards disabled people who do speak up um, and ignoring disabled people in the planning seems to be the response to all of this. I think you'll probably all be familiar with something that happened again during and after COVID, which was the street cafes and the street furniture that exponentially grew. And we all welcomed it because we were all stuck at home. We were all frightened to go into places even when they opened. We wanted to sit out outside, including myself, with friends and family, because all the connections had been cut off for so long. But actually for disabled people, it caused real problems because they couldn't get along the pavements. Sometimes they couldn't get into shops or their cars or even their own homes. That is a very real continuing problem in Glasgow. Similarly, city centre low carbon planning bans bringing cars into the city centre and ignores or even discriminates against disabled people who need to drive or who rely on support and who can't use public transport. And many disabled people rely on their cars or taxis to get around. So we need the infrastructure and the cost and the availability of taxis to be there for us. And we need parking and electric vehicles to be accessible and affordable so that disabled people can take the same actions as everybody else and travel whilst reducing our carbon footprint. Ultimately, our findings are that there's a real lack of understanding, a lack of analysis and insight about equalities and human rights dimensions of climate change, and that lack of understanding and that lack um, in parallel of involvement of disabled people means both that our needs and voices aren't heard and that the action plans, the actions planned causes further barriers and increased inequalities, sometimes with tragic consequences. And this failure to recognise disabled people within climate change and planning climate actions is something that we call eco-ableism. And some people here might have heard of that. And it needs to be replaced with accessible and participatory approaches, both to involve and support disabled people uh, in these processes. So GDA is calling for fairness and tackling inequality to be placed at the heart of designing climate change solutions so they don't inadvertently make things worse and widen inequalities. And we say that we want the drive to net zero to be matched by a drive to improve access and inclusion needs for disabled people so that we can take part in the actions themselves and the planning of these actions. And finally, um, and I'll stop after this, in relation to this, over 2022, over this year, using Scottish Government participatory budget and resources and other funding. Um, GDA is built on our work, which has led to, during and from our involvement with COP26. And it's included participation in the Community Climate Change Assembly event um, in partnership with the Science Centre and a range of climate cafes that we've held 
for our members, all that would be in great preparation for Green PB if there was such a thing in Glasgow, and we'd jump at it if there was. And our sessions have aimed to raise awareness and understanding of the science, the impacts, what climate change is for our members, because people don't always have clarity about that. They don't always have information at their fingertips, accessible information. We also have explored disabled people's concerns, which is what I'm sharing with you now, around climate change and ecoableism. We built capacity and developed skills so that people can highlight these barriers and identify the support they need to take part in climate actions and in contributing to actions that need to be taken. Um, so we want them to be able to take control and contribute to the practical actions to reduce emissions, um, but also to participate in how budgets are spent to address climate change and related processes and actions. And that's all on hold, that particular part of it in Glasgow. And our manifesto for the local government elections called for a number of things. Support disabled people to participate in co-design and inclusive policies and actions to achieve a, a just transition across the full range of interrelated areas, so employment, social care, transport, housing, education, you saw from the performance that these things are all interconnected. We want co-design with disabled people and our organisations. We want the citywide and local plans and actions and decisions to be co-designed with us. Things like low emission zones, active travel, uh, the, you know, livable neighbourhoods, all of these things that are being done that are great but need to have disabled people's voices so that they don't widen inequalities. And we want action to be taken and investment in communities of identity, as well as place, so that we avoid unintentionally widening all these inequalities in the public realm and in Green PB when it happens for us in Glasgow and in climate action plans and schemes. So we're asking for the race uh, for rights for disabled people to be as important as the race to reach net zero. And I'm going to stop there. Um, and, and hand back to Dave. And I think probably one of the things we didn't do was all say our names and introduce ourselves, but I know we've got, it's quite a small group. So Dave, I'm not sure if you're thinking breaking into smaller groups or if we just have a discussion together. I think if um, people are happy enough, I think we've got enough to split into a couple of smaller groups actually, just to kind of reflect on what Tressa said and what we've seen with the with the video as well, and give us a chance to introduce ourselves to each other in the in the small groups as well. Um, so maybe you could in in kind of small groups for about maybe twenty five minutes, half an hour, and then we can come back together and ref, you know share our reflections on on what you've been saying as well, Tessa, because the really key themes coming coming out of that as well, and I think uh, people will have their own kind of views and re reflections on that, and it would be useful to get that in that kind of smaller group discussion to allow everybody to have a have a say as well. So. Uh, I'm just going to open up the rooms just now. I'm going to split. Tressa, Tressa will lead one group and I'll I'll lead the other. Uh, and um, we'll come back together in about half an hour or so, maybe for about quarter past. Well, I'll put the room. questions in the chat, but we can follow the direction and the lead of the people as well. We don't need yes. to talk about these things. We can talk about others if they're more important. Thank you. Thanks, Tressa. Right, Thanks. okay, I'm just opening the rooms just now. And I'll, I'll, join, I'll join room one in a minute. Once everybody, once everybody's yeah. in. Sorry about that abrupt hauling people back in, but we were, we were just about up for time. Okay, um, thanks for that. We had a really, really good discussion in our group. We could have gone on for a lot longer, as I'm sure you guys could as well. Do you want to just kind of reflect a couple of key points from the discussion before we, before we finish off and let folk go for their lunch? Um, Tristan, do you want to kick off from? Okay, um, anybody please come in. So we had a great discussion. We were talking about the kind of acceleration of the targets in climate change. We spoke about many things, but that, that is potentially leaving people behind. And there were people in our group, somebody from the Scottish government who's working on this very thing, really committed to trying to make sure that people have get, get to be involved. So we were having conversations about, we, we didn't really consider the questions at all. We kind of had a different conversation, which was absolutely fine. In the end, we did reflect on some of them. Um, so people trying to uh, develop just transition plans and wanting to take inclusive approaches and asking some questions of me about what that might look like. And fair to say, there is capacity issues amongst disabled people-led organisations and resources are needed for some of these things. Um, so we spoke a bit about that. 
um, Oliver was talking about how some of the emphasis had been on the economic thrust about the industrial transition in some areas and carbon economy and that maybe we need to widen out the narrative of just transition. Um, do, I mean, Oliver, it'd be good if you could maybe just say that yourself because you said it so perfectly. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, it's, it kind of stands to reason that a just transition needs to be just on a number of dimensions. And of course, economic dimensions and class dimensions are at the heart of it, especially because they've been forgotten in previous transitions in Scotland, right? We're still sort of dealing with the aftermath of, of unjust, uh, de-industrialized um, sort of um, uh, historical developments. Um, so as part of that, a just transition now needs to be multidimensional. And yes, it has to be to have economy and class at the heart of it, but also uh, arguably, uh, you know, all, all other um, protected characteristics and all the qualities that we have embedded in, in legislation. So, uh, and of course, there's always, you know, there's, there's something, one of the powerful things about the just transition framing is that it gives us a clear focus, um, but that clear focus, I think, still has a space to, to be more sensitized to the multiple qualities and they all intersect because you know economic inequalities and all other inequalities are often uh, just linked so i think that narrative needs to make a space for a just transition for all kinds of communities of place practice purpose interest identity and, and so on great right. that kind of resonates a wee bit with us sorry Trace, but i'm kind of button into your feedback but i think just we we started off talking about human rights approach in terms of climate justice and you'd mentioned that a couple of times in your, your input earlier on and then talked about social model of disability and kind of social model of health social model of climate if you like um, is really really important to underpin the responses to that as well so, the, so if we don't get that and we, we were saying basically structures and systems and governments successive governments haven't got that over decades never mind in just the past few years then that's the starting point when you really need people to start from the point of hum, human rights about considering i, I like your, your your kind of description that a little bit about widening out the narrative of just transitions to be more than just about the economic to be about all those other barriers that, that, that people People face and the kind of support that's that needed to get people even on that start of that level playing field. Sorry, Tris, I put it in. Uh, no, listen, it was that, that's, that was a big, big part of it, but also mm -hmm. um, just talking about um, how sometimes uh, we were talking about how sometimes civil society leads sometimes the government leads but there, there's good people in government that are aware of this so we kind of need to all do our bit and our best um, and I was talking about the just the challenges of trying to get the ministers and the cabinet to take these issues and make them policy mm -hmm. intense rather than us having to fight for it all the time but that that's tricky so yeah. we all know it needs to happen I think nobody disagrees with that but sometimes the targets can detract from the time to involve people so time is a factor in all of this as mm -hmm. well there is a big pressure and I was saying Glasgow is a big egocentric council it wants to trailblaze it wants to do everything first and it absolutely leaves disabled people behind every time it does that and it doesn't do it on every area but it is doing it on this area so it's, it's worth saying you know they've done well in some areas mm -hmm. they did quite well in PB but then they dropped PB so that that's just an example of it but I'm sure that's the case in other areas as well interested to hear what else you were talking about Dave and also anybody else from our group please come in as well yeah I think I was kind of, I think I've probably covered most of what we were talking about because we did talk about looking at this through human rights lens and, and social model and lens as well. Um, we did talk a bit about, well, so about, I suppose, the scale and size of the, of the problem. And if you're talking about climate change, it's probably it is the biggest issue, it's global, and about how that makes people feel who are already facing huge barriers to being able to achieve relatively small stuff in their own local areas or whatever. So and how that might make people disengage or feel totally powerless to achieve that kind of change. So I think there, there was that kind of consideration in our discussions as well. This is this is massive. So what can we do about it? And we're, we're talking a lot about the, I suppose, the COVID situation of 
maybe how powerless people felt in in the COVID in the COVID situation as well, about the parallels to to that as well. But we also saw great responses from communities and people facing the disadvantage through COVID as well. So the, so there is really kind of see opportunities there as well um, to recognise the strength of those kind of networks and and the folk like ourselves probably on yourselves working on the ground to actually make good things happen and to help make good things happen as well. Pat, you've, you've got your hand up, you can chip in. On mute. Yeah, sorry. Um, I think what's going through my head as you're talking is this whole question of, and I don't like the word, but I think you'll understand it, intersectionality, whereby everything we're talking about today is interrelated. And I think it's one of the things that we need to work with the government about is stopping working in silos and understanding that every part, everything they do, every part of their policy has an impact on and should be influenced by, in this case, disabled people. Um, and equally with climate change, climate justice, there is no one thing the Scottish government does that doesn't have a relationship in some way with climate change and climate justice. Great, Pat. You know, that, that, that's really, really important to recognise that the intersection. I don't um, um, worry about using that intersectionality thing because I think it describes it, sums it up. Uh, so. Shorthand. <laughs> <laughs> Any more folk from, from, from my group want to kind of um, chip um, in? Cogs, you, you've got yeah, something there. Uh, we also talked about um, one of the, the barriers and, and difficulties of people kind of accessing other services is that disabled admin um, about how difficult it is as I, I, Tessa you've already mentioned it before but if you're someone that is freezing and starving um, if you are already fighting a fight on all fronts how are you meant to be able to think about something that is that is not directly in front of you um, and it is like just that intersection of the fact that we need to re remove those um, social inequalities of what people are currently experiencing so they're able to have a look at other things that matter to them um, because at the minute people are just trying to keep their heads above water and trying to survive um, when uh, the world's not really built for them to do that um, whilst uh, climate change is such a, an important issue and something that we really need to be taking uh, consideration of when you are um, already uh, dealing with so many issues in your life as a disabled person it's very hard to put those resources to someone else. Um, Judith you've got your hand up just going to uh, kind of find a wee Point yeah. we finish just to follow on from calls as well, just kind of like the Maslow's hierarchy of needs kind of model. I kind of mm -hmm. think it's really appropriate here. So just kind of meeting your basic needs before you can progress up the, the yeah. pyramid into more sort of like societal good for other people type of objectives. And, and that reflects if your thinking is there, then your actions are going to be there as well. So it is really the basic needs. Yeah. Um, of everyone, of people with and without disabilities need to be met mm. before we can look at things from like a society, what can we do to help? And I think, yeah, I think coming out of the pandemic, I spoke a bit in the group about sort of a lot of people being me, 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 but it is kind of necessary before you can, um, you can look at issues for other people, I suppose. You do need to have your basic needs met and a lot of people's needs were very, very not met in the past few years, especially but even before that as well. It's, it's decades as you were, yeah. as we were talking about as well. So yeah, it's just a recognition that we are all, all human and we've got needs. And um, but also we're a group as well. We're a group of people that care, and just keeping that doors open to to keep speaking would be really good. Great, thanks, Judith. Um, thanks everybody. Actually, I mean, that was a really good discussion in both groups. Thanks, Teresa really good kind of stimulating input as well and love to see in the video as well uh, with the, the purple poncho players um, as well. I mean, I've, what I've, I've put in and got a link to evaluation, session evaluation in the chat. It would be really good if, if, if we could fill that in and chance just for you to kind of reflect on the discussions that we've had as well, anything that, that's stimulated for you as well, because what we're hoping to do, be able to do is take kind of some of the key messages uh, from all the sessions that we're doing over these couple of days um, to the IOPD conference in 
Grenoble in France in December, uh, and, and he who to contributed a couple of sessions was chasing us up for it to get some key recommendations about what we how we can take a lot of the stuff forward and, and and support some of the the actions we've been talking about and addressing some of the challenges we've been talking about as well. So, in sharing them with our uh, European partners from from Portugal and France and and Spain as well. So, um, if you're able to kind of fill that in. Um, with your thoughts at your leisure, that would be great, uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing seeing all of that. And ho hopefully, it's been enjoyable for you this morning. Uh, and uh, there's another session this afternoon with Scan that we're doing as well. So uh, we've got two more sessions today before we finish off the caravan, if I like, or the camper van, as somebody said. <laughs> That's not very eco friendly. So we'll we'll just we'll we'll, we'll stick with the caravan idea. I think. Brilliant. And just, just yeah. can I say as well, finally, no, don't want to have the last word, but the second last word, and then I'll pass back to you. Last, last word's fine, we just, just, <laughs> It is very overwhelming when you hear what the barriers are and the intersecting nature of mm. them. They are intersecting, they are connected. It does require considered, thoughtful understanding and analysis to come up with the solutions. But actually, even if we can't do everything, we can do something. We can all do a wee bit and take heart that disabled people know that this is tough and disabled people are happy. I mean, I don't want to say we're happy with the crumbs, but we pretty much are. We are happy if people can do any small things towards helping until the bigger changes come. So take heart in that because that is fine with us. It's, it's the plan that we're going to get some something better that matters, that's much better than having no plan. So yeah. that's just kind of the final thoughts that I'd like to share. Thanks very much, Tressa. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Take care, everybody. Um, take care. Enjoy you. the rest of your, your day. Have a great time. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Bye now. <laughs>